Evening, ladies and gents. It's Simon Brown here. I'd like to introduce Keith McClutton from uh, Taper Stockbroking. And of course, you find him at smallcaps.coza. He does an update pretty much every day. So if you're interested in small mid caps, go along to smallcaps.coza. This evening, we're doing price to book. Uh, last webinar was from Keith last year was price earnings. We're looking at different valuation mechanisms and different ways of valuing companies. Uh, and we're going through those different ones. Keith is doing price to book this evening. This evening's one will be practical. Sorry, this evening's one will be theoretical. We'll talk about the theory. And then if, we'll do practical in the next webinar. If you've got ideas as to any particular stock you would like to have covered, let us know and we'll touch on that particular stock. But with that, over to Keith. Hi guys, thanks for coming tonight. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction, Simon. Uh, this, this webinar series is about fundamentals. If you remember the four pillars of fundamentals, um, is profitability, it's really the aim of the business. Liquidity, uh, remember that the key term there is cash is king. Solvency, debt versus risk. The more debt enhances returns but increases risk too. The final one is the qualitative assumption, that is management. Are they good or are they bad? And all of this leads us to an invest, to a valuation and a valuation leads us to an investment decision. So that's, that's the background. Um, we're looking at types of valuations now. We've worked through the theory of the four fundamentals. Um, let's just uh, have a quick overview of, of the types of valuations. I mean, the first starting point is market ratios. The obvious one is the price earnings model. We touched on that last week, or uh, well, last, last webinar, and the previous webinar we t uh, hit the theory. Then we, then we applied it in a case study. Uh, price to book model. Also, a market ratio. Once again, uh, this week we're doing theory, and next, uh, well, this this webinar we're doing theory, and next next webinar we are doing a case study. Uh, so I'm open to suggestions. I just want to add uh, to Simon's Simon's request for um, companies you're likely to look at price to book ratio. Please limit it to the JSE. Then dividend yield model is also another market ratio. There's price earnings growth, PEG model, there's EV EBITDA, there are as many market ratios as you can think of ratios, as you can think of how to add plus divide, multiply things by each other. There's also other types of valuations. It's the uh, discounted cash flow valuations. They, these are absolute valuations. Um, the obvious one is a discounted free cash flow. You've heard of the term DCF. Um, that's far in the future, but we will be touching on that. There's also dividend discount models. Um, now, this evening's uh, webinar is about price to book ratio. So what exactly is a price to book ratio? Well, it works in a formula. Every ratio is a formula. The formula for price to book is the share price divided by the net asset value per share. That equals the price to book ratio. Let me say it again. The share price divided by the net asset value per share. There's other ways to calculate this. Um, if you remember what a market cap is, it's, it's the share price times the number of shares in the company. If you had to buy the entire company at that price, um, at, at its current share, uh, share price, that's what we call the market cap or market capitalization, you can take that and divide it by the equity. Now, these are interchangeable terms. Equity is the same as net asset value. When you divide it by the number of shares in existence, that's why we talk about the net asset value per share. Net asset value per share is the same as equity per share. The market cap is the same as the share price times by the number of shares. You see how these two equations are interchangeable. You've just got to make sure you're using the same terms with the same terms. It's either at a per share, per share basis or it's at a per company basis. Interchangeable terms. From now on, we're going to use at the share level basis, the share price divided by net asset value per share. That's what I'm going to be talking about from now on. So now we've defined a price to book ratio. How do we explain it? Uh, price to book ratio is best explained as what multiple of the business's theoretical liquidation value are you paying? Just think about that. First of all, multiple. Second of all, business's theoretical liquidation value. Now, I include the word theoretical because um, price to book ratio is calculated off a company's balance sheet. So there's, you have to be assuming that the balance sheet approximates market price, approximates its property auditors, property accounted for, uh, and second of all, that when you liquidate the company, that's what you'll actually get. 
So while now, if, if you remember the previous two webinars, we looked at the price earnings ratio. Price earnings ratio is the share price divided by the earnings per share. Once again, that's the, 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 the shareholder level ratio. Um, now the price earnings ratio, because it includes earnings, focuses on the income statement, on the profits. Remember the four fundamentals of, of, of uh, uh, the four pillars of fundamentals. One of them is profitability. Uh, that's the income statement. The price to book is a ratio that focuses on the balance sheet. Now, the balance sheet uh, in nowadays is called the statement of financial position, and it's quite literally what the company looks like right now, today, um, without profits, without revenues, without anything. If we if we pause in the moment of time, what does the company look like? Two different approaches. Now we've defined what the pr uh, price to book ratio is. We um, we've given a very brief. Uh, explanation for, for what it really means, but you get different types, just like you get different types of price earnings, forward and historical, if you remember the previous webinar, you also get different types of price to book ratios. The first one is on the net, net asset value of a company. Now a net asset value is what we're calling, from now on we're going to talk about NAV. The NAV is very simple. If you remember the balance sheet's made up of, of it's the accounting equation. Assets less liabilities equals equity. Well, net asset value is the equity. If you took a company's net asset value, it is the equity of the company. If you took a, a share's net asset value, is if they liquidated the entire company and they got exactly um, its assets and they paid off exactly its uh, liabilities, they would pay out for that one share exactly the same amount that, uh, that its net is. Going back to that, net asset value, the NAV is assets less liabilities equals equity of the company. Once again, it is the accounting liquidation value of the balance sheet. I em emphasize this accounting because accounting, by definition, is, includes a large amount of esti uh, estimation. You're estimating depreciation rates, estimating fair values, estimating a lot of things in the balance sheet. Um, so this is not necessarily the truth, but it's a good foundation to work with. You get another type of price to book ratio. It's what, um, now, oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. The net asset value, based on the accounting, assets less liabilities uh, equals uh, equity, it assumes one thing. It assumes that the accounting valuation approximates the economic and liquidation value. Remember I said accounting has a lot of estimation therein? Um, well, that is the assumption when you're working with the net asset value. Um, the way you can calculate it, because I'm, from now on I'm going to be talking about NAV per share, um, it, it is the net asset value of the company, in other words, equity, divided by the number of shares in the company. Once again, we're looking at a per share basis, so anything at a company level is not that meaningless and not the meaningful for a minority investor. You want to work out whether a single share on the stock market is worth buying or not. Hence, we're talking about NAV per share. So, the previous, uh, previous net asset value, well, the previous price to book ratio is based on NAV, NAV per share. Now, there's another one, and this is the, the, you need to understand the subtle difference between the two. So, what we talk about the tangible net asset value. Sometimes they talk about uh, the net tangible asset value, TNAV, or, or net tangible asset value are all the same. I like using tangible net asset value. The principle is the same. The equation is simple. Once again, assets, sorry, there should be a minus sign here, assets, less, less liabilities, and less, there should be another minus sign here, intangible assets, equals tangible equity. Now, what have we done here? We've stripped out. We said, yes, there's a lot of assets on the balance sheet, and we'll take the liabilities off from them. So we left with equity. But then some of the assets are intangibles. What do I mean by intangible? I mean I can't touch it, I can't feel it, it's maybe worthless. So this is a very brutal, cold uh, price-to-book ratio to work with. This is a tangible TNAB, tangible net asset value. What it assumes, whereas the previous one assumed was the balance sheet was a fair value for the company's liquidation, um, uh, liquidation value based on the counting assumptions, this one assumes that the riskiest assets in the balance sheets are the ones we can't touch. 
So it assumes that they are worthless. And that includes, um, uh, uh, that includes accounts like uh, goodwill, on, uh, goodwill which arises in acquisitions. It also includes things like, um, things like uh, intellectual property, software assets capitalized, R&D capitalized. Um, it can include a lot of things. If you, if you ever come across a balance sheet uh, account that you're not sure whether it's tangible or intangible, the question you've got to ask yourself to know what it is, is can you touch it? If you can't, it's intangible. And then be conservative, just write it off as worthless. Now, as I said, the tangible, the TNAV is more conservative than the NAV. Um, as an intangible, offered, uh, an intangible asset often um, does not have a value, or in liquidation doesn't have a value, so the TNAV may overstate the company's liquidation value just in the same way the TNAV may understate the price to book ratio. Okay, so we jumped around a lot. Remember, we define what a price to book ratio is. It is what multiple of liquidation value we're willing to pay. There's two types. There's net asset value, which is the liquidation value based on the counter principles. Then there is the tangible net asset value, which is stripping out all, all the assets that are questionable, basically the intangible assets. Um, now, the question is, obviously from there, which price to book ratio? Um, two major ones, NAV or TNAV, we touched on that, and there's two major benchmarks. Remember on the price earnings ratio, we could look at a lot of different comparatives and historical and legacy and forward and things like that. Price to book ratio as well. So we can either use NAV or TNAV and we can compare them versus a single comparator. For example, if you're looking at a major electronics company, maybe Ellie's, have a look at General Electric. If you're looking against a single share, you can also look against this history. Um, I wouldn't use a price to book ratio versus an index, and I wouldn't use it against the market because it is insanely complicated to calculate it. Now, it would be a fantastic benchmark, but it is not as easy and as published as, as a price earnings. So if you have all the time in the world, I encourage you to calculate those, but this is a practical course. We're trying to equip you guys with skills you can actually go out there and use. Price to book ratios aren't commonly quoted, so the easiest approach is just simply to look at it versus a comparative or against the history, which you can actually calculate. Now, we've defined price to book ratio, we've looked at the different types. Let me jump directly into, in my experience, there's really two rules of thumb, because you've got, uh, if, if we look at the previous one, remember I said NAV or TNAV, and I've given you two comparators. Now, you can use NAV against a single comparative and NAV against a history. You can also use TNAV against a single comparative and TNAV versus a history. So you have a combination of at least four that you can use. Which one should you? And that's why I've built a rule of thumb. And there's two rules here that you can apply, and they are actually contradictory. And I'll explain why, and I'll explain how you resolve that contradiction. First of all, First rule of thumb is the higher the bankruptcy risk or the higher the quantum, meaning the amount, of intangibles, the more reason you should use tangible net asset value in your price to book ratio. First of all, higher the bankruptcy risk means the, the closer you are to actually liquidating the company. So the more meaningful what you actually can get out. And remember I said there's a higher risk that intangibles actually have no value. So the higher the bankruptcy risk, the more you should use tangible NAV as opposed to intangible NAV. Well, NAV. And then the second one is the higher the quantum of intangibles. Quantum meaning amount. Now if you look at a balance sheet um, and you actually look at the number of intangibles versus tangible assets, you know, there could be billions upon billions upon billions of capitalized intangibles, yet there's next to no tangible assets. The guy sitting in his basement on a computer, or he's, he's selling things from his car, and he's just capitalized all the expenses, and he's capitalized all, all the things he's probably capitalizing on the balance sheet. So the higher the quantum of intangibles, the riskier that balance sheet becomes. So the more you should exclude them. And hence, you use the tangible nerve. The second one is, the second rule of thumb, and I'll explain how this is contradictory, is now there are businesses out there where their value 
isn't the balance sheet. It is the intellectual property or the RP. Um, so ignoring the first rule, the second rule of thumb is the more intellectual property involved in the business model, the more reason you should use NAV and not TNAV in your price to book ratio. This involves a little bit of trust. You've got to trust the auditors doing their job, the accounts are doing their job, and everyone's legitimate. But let me give you an example. Uh, have a look at Google. You know, their asset isn't their balance sheet. Well, it wasn't when they started. It was the intellectual property of the founders, intellectual property of building a brand name. Have a look even closer to home on, on the JRC. I would never use net asset value to value, well, as de to definitively value a technology share listed on the JSC. It would make no sense. Technology is intellectual property. You can't, most of that isn't capitalized. Um, so do you see how already this is contradictory? Because a, a business that is service oriented or technology oriented will have a lot of quantum of intangibles on the balance sheet. Whereas a business that isn't, won't. So by these two rule of thumbs and a, a, a service or technology oriented business with lots of intellectual property, I'm telling you to value it on TNAB. That's the wrong approach. You've also got to bear in mind what sector the company is because there's, there's a lot of assets that may not have been capitalized in, in, in the first place. So there is no conclusion to these rule of thumbs. I'm just stating both of them and you decide when to use them. My advice looking at industrials, looking at banks, looking at uh, real, you know, real companies like that with lots of tangible assets, use TNAB. When you're looking at technology companies and companies who built up their revenue streams based on the skills, the employees, or the reputation they're in, then you can start to use NAV. Not a perfect rule of thumb, but it gives you a bit of guidance. Now, Price to book ratio, remember I said when, I was, when we did an overview of the valuation models, every valuation model will arrive at an answer. It will. If you're doing it all right, it will at least arrive at an answer. How good is that answer? And that's why we use as many valuation models as possible because each answer of each valuation model has its own pros and cons. Now, the pros and cons of a price to book ratio is, well, the pro is it's quick and easy. The net as the value of the NAS, and even most of the time the tangible NAS, but you can calculate it either way because I've, I've given you the formula. It is quick and easy. It's out there. You have it per share. Take the share price, bang, and you, and, and, and you can you can uh, you can uh, crunch that out for a range of companies. So quick and easy. Second one is is, is conceptually simple. Liquidation value, what multiple? If you're buying a company at below tangible NAS and it's profitable. Well, you're buying it below liquidation value, but it's not going bankrupt. So it's conceptually simple because you're getting a good bargain. Now the cons, oh, sorry. Um, the other pros, it tends to be conservative. The price to book ratio tends to undervalue companies. Um, but it also depends whether the company is profitable. And, and this is part of the cons. If the company is not profitable, then you have to almost start discounting the future losses into its current net asset value. To, to use that. that. That's stepping up to a whole nother webinar, but I'm pointing it out here to bear in mind. Assuming the company is profitable, the price to book ratio can be conservative. So you may actually arrive at an answer below, below where you should be. Now the cons. You risk missing the bigger picture. Price to book ratio, you cannot use in isolation ever, no matter what people say. Um, you know, there's earnings, there's cash flows, there's dividends, there's a lot of other things. There's maybe even, maybe you're buying a company because it's going to be a takeout target. There's so many other things to consider. Don't do, uh, need to emphasize this. Do not just use one valuation model in isolation. And the next major con in my mind is the price to book ratio ignores profitability. Absolutely. Remember how we focused on the balance sheet, the whole, this entire webinar? You ignore the fact that the company exists to make profits. So if it's not going to liquidate, the balance sheet only matters to you as far as it will earn you profits and as far as those will pay you dividends. So price to book ratio completely ignores profitability of the company. Price to earnings ratio and price to book ratio are two quick ways to approach the same problem and they balance each other out. But once again, um, I would not use anything in isolation. Um, and this is why price-to-book ratio may ignore profitability. Now, a lower price-to-book ratio of a share 
may, if you just glance at it, it may look like the share is cheaper, but it may actually exist because the asset is being efficiently priced because that company is not using its balance sheet as efficiently to earn profits uh, as as a comparative that is perhaps earning better profits, better margins, better revenues. Um, so a lower price to book ratio of a share may be due to its relative lower profitability compared to peers and vice versa. Just because a, com a company is trading at a huge price to book ratio doesn't mean it's necessarily overvalued. Have a look at that level of profitability. good example in the JSC is Tiger Brands. Tiger Brands has an incredibly high return on equity. is incredibly profitable. But, but it trades at a five times price to book ratio versus the rest of the market, excluding it, that trades on an average of 1.5 to 2.5. Uh, so if you just looked at that valuation uh, metric, it would be overvalued. But in reality, in reality, you need to bear in mind its profitability. But um, now, conclusion for price to book ratio is, um, first of all, look at the formula, understand the formula. Price to book ratio is the share price divided by net asset value per share and don't forget, you can also use tangible net asset value per share. The price to book ratio, what it means is it's essentially a liquidation value multiple. It gives you a margin of safety. Below one, you can start to feel a bit comfortable. You're buying it below liquidation value, theoretically. And above one, you have to start looking at profitability and see where it's justified. Um, there's two types of uh, liquidation values. There's net asset value and there's tangible net asset value. And net Tangible net asset value is net asset value or equity, which is the same thing, less intangibles. Don't forget to get a per share answer divided by the number of shares in issue. You can compare it against history or against peers. Against the market or against the index would be perfect, but those numbers are incredibly, incredibly complicated to crunch because they're not freely published. And then finally, Price to book model is simple and intuitive to use, but it does ignore a company's profitability. Don't forget that. Price to book ratio is easy, quick, and simple. Gives you a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling, but it is not the holy grail of valuations. It is just one more tool in your arsenal to win the war of making more money in the market. Um, next webinar, we'll be talking about the price to book models in the JSC. And I'm open to suggestions. Last webinar, we did a pick and pay um, for the price earnings ratio. Uh, I can do the same thing. I can do another one. Um, guys, just uh, drop Simon or me your suggestions. Uh, folks, if you've got any questions coming through, you can either put them in the text box uh, in the GoToWebinar application, or if you've got a microphone attached, raise your hand. I'll activate your mic and we can take an audio question. Keith, a couple of questions coming through and a couple of suggestions. Someone said, why not stick with pick and pay? It's not a bad idea. Someone else said, why not Capitec or Able? Um, I would trade for Capitec, of course, because I'm a shareholder and I want to know if they're worth anything. But to the point there, and it, it came from uh, Susan. She's saying often when she sees on, on, on TV and the like, People use price to book most often with banks, the Capitex, the, the Absys, but particularly Capitec and Able, and, and maybe uh, JD Group, who kind of a quasi bank, Lewis, who more of a bank perhaps. Is it perhaps more viable to use in that space, or is that just the analysts we've got? Well, uh, uh, a bank's profitability is defined by its balance sheet, because if you are a bank, banks are highly leveraged assets. So if you are borrowing money from the Reserve Bank of South Africa Saab, you're borrowing it at repo rates, then you on lend it to uh, other people. Literally, what is capitalizing your bank is your 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 I mean, capitalizing your balance sheet. Your balance sheet is your asset. So the bigger the balance sheet, the greater your ability to leverage it. Um, and at the same time, they're highly leveraged in uh, like highly leveraged business models. So you need a, a margin of safety from a valuation perspective. So a, a, a bank approach, a net uh, price to book, is extremely applicable because your balance sheet is almost more important than your income statement in a, ba in a bank. Cash flow statement as well, but we're not going to get into that. Um, but a balance, sh a balance sheet is your, you, 
I mean, uh, at, at, at risk of sounding redundant and repeating myself, a, a bank on lends its balance sheet. It leverages its balance sheet. Its balance sheet is its long-term profitability, and you're buying it as a multiple of that. So it's highly applicable to that industry. Question coming from uh, Sipo. He's asking, do companies publish their NAV and, and when do they publish it? Sipo, from my experience, they publish it uh, with their six-month results. I'm not sure if it's a requirement, but we don't always see TNAV, but I'm pretty sure we always see NAV. My understanding is, is that it's a requirement of the JSC to publish NAV, and TNAV is optional. That's why a lot of companies don't publish it. Um, that said, uh, it's very simple to calculate uh, TNAV. You just take the equity, uh, remove all the intangible assets, and divide it by the number of shares. Because they have to publish equity, they have to publish the balance sheet, which includes the intangibles, and they have to publish the number of issued shares. Make sure you don't use the number of weighted shares. Use the number of issued shares. Just just a point in that. Um, and they publish this with their with their um, financial statements, which they have to with their results, which they have to publish six monthly. Some companies, depending on where they listed, or optionally can publish quarterly. Um, bear in mind the change in that and whether the company is earning profits or losing profits, because sometimes if the company is bleeding bleeding money left, right, and centre, losing money everywhere then NAV is overstated by the time they publish it because they've already lost more than that. Worth, worth remembering. Uh, Fumani, give me a sec. I will activate your mic. Fumani, you should be on. I've got a question for Keith. Yeah, if you would have to live with the top five ratio, what would it be? Top five ratio in order for you to make a investment. I know that there's no holy grail, but what would you say are the most top five uh, ratios? Well, the top five in order of priority in my mind would be EV EBITDA right up front. That's a coming webinar, so tune in for that. But EV EBITDA is the enterprise value divided by the earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. So you're stripping out accounting complications and you're including debt and gearing, a gearing neutral approach. Then I would say it starts to become very industry specific. You know, if, you, if you're working with banks or, or companies where balance sheets are quite important, small caps also because bankruptcy risk is high. Remember the two rules of thumb. Price to book is maybe a little bit more important than price earnings, assuming the company will earn profits in the future. Then, um, then there's price earnings. Price earnings, if you're working with a very stable company, Pick and Pay was a good example of that case study, and that's why we did it. Very stable earnings, very stable company, strong everything, no liquidation, no risk. Um, and not overly amounts of intangibles in the balance sheet, uh, price earnings is good. Don't forget dividend yield. Now, th 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 there's a highly skeptical point of view in the stock market that the only real profits in existence are the ones paid into your bank account by dividends. Because everything else could be end run profits, which uh, no one appreciated when that came to a conclusion. So I would put dividend yield right up there. And then thereafter, it starts to become very case specific. You know, uh, you're working with technology companies. You want to start looking at uh, EBITDA generated per per employee. You you want to you know you're working with uh, construction companies. You want to start you want to start looking at uh, you know various gearing ratios you can extrapolate across uh, valuations. You so still in my mind the top three right up in front is EV EBITDA most important one. And I hope all of you guys attend that uh, that uh, webinar when we do that. Next one, price to book and price earnings tied for second and third place. Fourth place, dividend yield. Fifth place, you start becoming in, increasingly uh, industry specific. And uh, perhaps, perhaps I'll have a whole other webinar where I look at in industry specific uh, ratios. Uh, Keith, I think you do. And the question from Henry is it's about combinations of valuation methods rather than a standalone. And that's exactly what you're saying here. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's no holy grail uh, in, in, in valuation methods, and if all of them agree with each other, then you have a, a margin of comfort that you're on the right track. Yeah, margin of comfort. Question from Tulang. He's asking, is NAV downloadable just like you would get history of, of price earnings, etc.? He mentions OST. Uh, short answer, I've had a quick check on the website. They do publish NAV. Um, what happens is, as, as the company publishes results every six months, the interim and the final, they push out a NAV. Not necessarily a T NAV, but definitely a NAV. 
from that we then find it on websites such as OST, but the data is from Profile Media, so pretty much all the online stockbrokers will have it. Uh, under their, their ratio analysis, they will give you the net asset value at each six months, so at mid-year and at year-end. Obviously, they don't publish it in between. Folks, we're going to leave it there. Uh, we've hit the 30-minute the, the time plus a bit. I must say, I've offered, press the books a comment I've heard a hundred times from different analysts. I don't think I've ever fully grasped it. Um, now I have, and it, it frankly sounds quite simple. I like it. I think the key thing is, is as Keith says, is either relative to its peers or relative to its own history. But we'll leave it there. Thanks very much for attending. And as always, thanks to Keith McClarkson. Cheers, guys. Thanks, guys, for coming.